simplicity is the ultimate sophistication says mr ramesh venkateshwara chairman and volunteer at vishwas a society for mental health mr venkateshwara has traveled from the corporate world to being a management consultant and teacher at iim bangalore and fed master at lawrence school uti his book the happiness trail is an amalgamation of this journey and the appreciation for mental health services which is very much needed today there are so many mental health books in the market mm-hmm. from the basics to the advanced versions according mm-hmm. to the writers so you've mentioned the idea of putting your thoughts in a book was initiated by a friend mm-hmm. was there a reason why you didn't think about it or you didn't relate to it before that mention was made oh no no not at all actually this book has been in my mind for about maybe 15 years 12 to 15 years well i started talking about this topic maybe in a serious manner about maybe 15 years ago okay and uh, it evolved over a period of time so the topic was largely because you know i moved out from the corporate world uh, into a management consulting world mm-hmm. and one day i just found myself in the world of school teaching as a headmaster of a school okay. and uh, Two years later, I was the head of a B school, full time into education. When I'm a hardcore corporate, corporate ma- salesman, marketing person. But so when I went to the school, and the school also happened to be my alma mater, and therefore there was a lot of heart in that. Not just uh, it was not a job. And I went for obviously, if somebody called me who is not a background, uh, who was an who was an alum. alumnus of the place there must have been reason so there is a history to that mm-hmm. so it was really at that time that i started talking about what are we doing in life what are children doing what, what's happening and it was largely focused actually on values and integrity it was more on on that it was somewhere later maybe 5 7 years later Uh, so i started building this into my curriculum in in, okay. in i would induct i would talk to the 11th and 12th standard Uh, students on this and then have discussions with them debates with them then when i went to the mysore business school i actually made this my first um, what i would call a first day first show kind of thing in the in the induction okay. all okay. new students would i would i would ask them to watch a film called a man for all seasons mm-hmm. it was a 1967 award winning seven academy award winning films and it had made an impact on me as a 16 year old 17 year old which i realized only in 2005 when i went to head the school so i would make them watch the film and uh, we would have a discussion on that so they would all have to sit in the auditorium and watch the film and then i would sit and debate discuss what does it mean what does it what does it involve what were the scenes they liked what are the implications so that was going on and then i built it into my strategy class at at the institute of management where i've been teaching for the last so many years so the mail from my friend only triggered a uh, a uh, uh, structuring it slightly differently so okay. mail from my friend came about 7 8 years ago which said we are all getting old we got grandkids is that <laughs> what, what are the five things you will leave behind for your grandchildren to lead a meaningful and and uh, then many of my students would come and t- tell me you know you got to write this into a book you got to make a book out of this make a book out of it and i therefore that book idea which was being triggered by my my students Mm-hmm. and my family and this idea from my friend sort of synthesized about maybe 2 3 3 years ago okay. and said okay great let me expand this and and create it so that's really where it went so it's not so much a mental health book it's not even a self help book somebody asked me is it a self help book um no, i i i joked with that person to say it's actually a self actualizing book i had to actualize myself right. and write it uh in the process the the feedback has been extremely positive and i i i i'm a double whammy winner, winner in that in some and way and if i may i absolutely enjoyed reading the book and when you first suggested that i go ahead and get the book um and you said it's it's very it's a layman can understand it it's very simple i i didn't know if maybe that's how simple it could be but when i read it i realized that you exactly said what the book would be and it was so easy to self actualize with the book and relate to so many life instances so thank you so much for putting the book out i always joke with people you see one of my one of my even in my strategy class this is my mantra so at the end of my course most students will say 
the one single point I take away from this course. And for me, that is simplicity is the ultimate sophistication. It's extremely difficult to be simple. And I say, if you can keep it simple, you, you achieved a lot. So, and the second thing I always tell my students jokingly is whatever I ask you to read, read it, because you'll be damn sure that even I understand it. And <laughs> if I can understand it, you will understand it. So I don't know how to make it more complex than that. Um, <laughs> so in the, in the third part of the book, uh, in part three of the book, there is stress, anxiety, dilemmas, which have been discussed um, in simple ways, of course, which today is a way of life. Unlike with our ancestors, if, and I, I believe that very strongly, um, simplicity and decisiveness, like you just said, the sim simple aspects of it can, and can make things sophisticated. So simplicity and decisiveness are quite the challenge, you know, given the wide range of possibilities and opportunities described by the internet and the variety of articles, blogs, books that are being put out. So how will, it, will a book like The Happiness Trail help? Okay, very, very, that's a very valid question. So let me just put my, you, actually the first part of my book talks about stress. The last part talks about the dilemmas. I just sort of come back a full circle. Okay. I talk about stress. Okay. What's, in fact, my first part is about what's happening in the world today. It's setting right. a context as to why the five eyes are relevant and important and so on. And your question is very valid. So, you know, um, how will this book help? So th this may be a slightly long answer because this is the context for the whole book. This is how the book got evolved over, over so many years. Uh, one of the things I say, and I have not put it in the book, but I, I use this analogy in classes. Um, one of the things I say is that, uh, why is it relevant to the audience today? I mean, it's relevant at any time, but why is it more relevant to an audience of anywhere between below 40, 45 years old? Mm -hmm. And let's say I, anybody above 20 might read this book, 80 to 20. <laughs> no. I mean, I don't expect anybody to go to a bookshop and buy this book. I mean, you know, it's very interesting. Uh, today's Times of India, yesterday's Times of India, I'll send this to you. Yesterday's Times of India actually says happiness is being made a subject to be taught in Madhya Pradesh schools. It's a it's a newspaper headline piece. Wow. So so it, it's it's interesting. So somebody said they must have read your book and decided to put it into the <laughs> syllabus. <laughs> that's that's very Maybe. flattering. <laughs> very flattering. But let's look at what's happening today. I'm comparing, let's say, me with you. Right? Mm -hmm. Let's say your generation and one little younger to you. Let's say. Uh, see, we. I like to use the analogy of life being a journey. You're flowing in a stream. And you, you start somewhere and you end somewhere. Now, when we took at my life, your parents' life, maybe your grandparents' life, our journey was on a stream, which was a very gently flowing stream. Uh, right. the, the stream flowed, the, there was no current, you got into a boat, you moved on. <laughs> Unlikely that you could go wrong on that journey. You know, it'll meander over somewhere. The water was shallow, six inches. You won't drown, you won't capsize, you hit some little bit, and then you move on. You know, the point I'm trying to make is the pace of life that we led, the way we led life was amazingly uncomplicated and simple. Mm. And therefore, whatever we did, we couldn't go too wrong in it. Right. By and large, you get where you want to go. Today, I say that you are you're a generation which is moving into what I call whitewater rafting and rapids and, and, and things like that. <laughs> yeah. So, you get onto a boat, you better have the skills, you better have a strategy, you better know what you're doing. Because one of two, three things can happen. One is you capsize and fall into the water, you're finished. Mm -hmm. Or you are navigating yourself and then you go and crash against a bank and then you wonder, what am I doing over here? <laughs> and you go over a waterfall and that's the end. The point I'm trying to make is today's life journey needs a lot more of thinking and planning and, and, and introspection, if you want to call it so. And therefore, I feel that we need to take stock of ourselves far more than people like who are, let's say, 60 plus. The people who are who born in the 50s and the 60s. Uh, nothing could happen that could substantially upset things for us. Right. And that is the reason why 
this book is written for that group of people. It's written for an 18 to 30 years, 40 year old people. I, of course, say if you're 45 plus, then you have children who need inputs and you could guide them. Mm-hmm. And I say, if you're 60 plus, you have grandchildren this is the <laughs> ideal thing to talk about. Yes. This was actually my son-in-law's diktat to me. And he kept telling me, you need to write a book for your grandson and granddaughter. And I finally told him, this is the book. So I would think, I would think it's not a self-help group, uh, book. It's not so much a self-help book. It's more a, a stock-taking book, a stock-taking introspection book. So that is why I, if in the first part of the book, I talk so much about stress, social media, what's happening, what's not happening, the pressure to win, the pressure to conform, the pressure to perform. None of this was here because, you know, let's look at it this way, Pallavi. When we were born, we had one car to choose from and that was all the car you had. So, you know, you are proud of the fact that you owned a car for 20 years. You owned a a refrigerator for 25 years. You proudly told people. Today, your son or daughter or grandchild is probably not not, not quite amazed and maybe a little awkward that you have actually continued to use that fridge for the last five years. You haven't changed it. <laughs> right. So the point I'm making is the social fabric has changed substantially. Mm. And therefore, today, I think when you're moving ahead in life, you need to give it a lot more thought than what we needed to give. And, and that was really the content. The second, third part, I can come to it separately if you we can talk about it. The dilemmas, it leads from the first part right. to saying... Because of all this, you are in a fix. You are, you'll, you'll face a lot of crossroads. Right. So you'll face a lot of crossroads in life where you have to take a decision. And the five eyes helps you take that decision. Yes, yes. I, I, did, I did understand that from the reading. And it is surprising, if, even with everything you've said right now, it is very surprising how all age groups, not only the millennials or the younger generations, but even the baby boomers i have i have experienced on a one on one level where because of the options thanks to technology and i mean the mean this in a good way and a slightly negative way if i may say so it's um their decision making skills have dropped to such an extent that even uh, because of the variety available say on amazon for example you want to go and shop you know what you want to go and buy uh, but once you look at the screen, you're just lost. You have no clarity and you want to think about maybe this is not what I wanted to buy. Maybe something is something as simple as that. And it is surprising that we're at that stage right now in 2022. And I, it's kind of um, nerve wracking to imagine what what will be in, in such simple matters. Um, but there, the, your book really, really helps, you know, um, Bring, bringing perspective into, you know, a layman, layman's thought process of a, a daily, day-to-day lifestyle. And, and there's a quote in the book by Bertrand Russell, which is, beggars do not envy millionaires, though, of course, they will envy other beggars who are more successful. <laughs> I loved it. When I read that, I smiled I, year to year. So could you elaborate on the why and how of this trait uh, and, and w- how we end up um, justifying our own limitations, you know, to, uh, to ourselves? Here again, you know, I'm addressed in the book and let me come to the simplest form of anything. <laughs> See, why do, why do people, why are we unhappy? I mean, I'm, I'm not getting into a philosophy. See, I'm not a philosopher. I'm not a social scientist. I'm just a salesman. And as I call it, I'm a marketing guy. And as I as I mentioned that the minute you talk of happiness and the minute you talk of all these you know uh, uh, altruistic stuff, immediately you you would take values this that you are immediately what I've written in the book and I say you are co- you quote the Bible you quote the Quran you quote the Big Gita or you quote Plato or uh, Socrates and that's what I call the wisdom of the ages you know but this book is what I call the wisdom of age just growing old and uh, <laughs> with. Great. And therefore, there's nothing very sophisticatedly complicated, except I've been lucky to read a lot thanks to writing the book. So when you look at it, I'm not, I'm not even getting into difference between pleasure and happiness and meaning and all of that. But mm-hmm. let's say, why do we so-called quote unquote unhappy? It's because there is a gap between what we expect and what we get. 
See, the whole business of dissatisfaction happens because of a gap between what I expect and what I actually get. Right. And we can discuss this as a separate topic, but essentially there is a gap. So let's look at where does uh, where does this so-called unhappiness come from? The stress. And therefore, when I'm unhappy, I'm stressed. Mm. I, I hope we're okay on that. Yes. If I'm happy, yes. I'm not stressed. Stress, again, I'm using it in the negative sense, though I've said stress is a neutral word. In the book, you will see there is a you stress, good stress, and distress, the distress, bad stress. Yes. <laughs> but let's not talk worry about it. Let's use stress as what we understand it as a common, in common parlance. Now, so basically, when do I, when do I get unhappy? I have an expectation and I don't have that expectation fulfilled. And this is one of them. Now, the second is I have the expectation. And the second is I see my friends are having something. So I envy that person. I envy that person. So this is what I think Bertrand Russell means. I don't envy an Ambani for the helicopter he has. <laughs> I do not envy a Bill Gates or, a, or a Elon Musk for what they have. I may be envious of them in, in, a, in a very benign way, if you want to call it so. Mm. But, but the minute my neighbor or my schoolmate who was a complete dumb guy <laughs> in school, and this guy has, when the day he sends me the message saying, I just bought my new Jaguar or my new uh, thing, I'm wondering what, what happened? How, how can this happen? And I start getting angry. So the challenge here really is, the, for me, I think the triggers for a lot of unhappiness is about between expectation and envy. Mm. Now, the expectation is not only me. You know, I've written it again. You know that for us in India, or anywhere in the world, your parents throw up expectations, your, yes. your social yes. pressures, the expectations comes from everywhere. everywhere. It's not, it's, it's not, but ultimately you have to decide on what to set your expectations. So expectation leads to envy. I expect that I am smarter than Pallavi. And when Pallavi has got something, I envy you or I envy you. And that goes to set my expectations. So I think this is, this is for me, one of the root things. Now, you, what Bertrand Russell, I can, I can explain that very beautifully and simply in what the three characteristics of envy. The three characters. The envy is about three things. One is somebody has something that I don't have. Number one. Second is I want that thing. Mm -hmm. And the third, my not having it and your having it causes me pain. Now that is why he says when the other beggar has it, it causes me pain. When Elon Musk has it, I don't care. It doesn't really matter to me. So this is what, and that is why, you know, all these things you will find envy and all of this, it starts affecting personal relationships. It affects social interactions and so on and so on. So this is why this book has been written from all these perspectives to say, take stock of yourself. Yes. So it's not so much a self-help group as I, a book as much as a stock taking book, you know, Make an assessment. And I definitely feel and I hope that more and more people get a hold of this book because it definitely would help to break down, break down and clarify a lot of things within oneself, which is very necessary because envy can so easily cause self-deprecation. It, it, it's quite a synonym if you look at it that way and the three ways that you've explained it. And this is another part of uh, social pressures that I wanted to discuss with you, which is when it comes to bullying in schools, um, in colleges, now workplaces, and even more so within the families itself. Sometimes it's done consciously, maybe because of envy. Sometimes it's done without realizing it at all. But people who are watching it, people who are responsible in setups like schools and colleges, they don't really do much about it. Their reaction to it is superficial optimism or just simply to acknowledge after a few warnings and then they end up suspending somebody or lay, laying them off or something like that, which is ultimately not a job well done when it comes to mental health issues. Where, you know, when you look at it that way and people need more people who are either on, on the victim side of it or people who are causing it both ways, they need more, especially because throughout life as a journey, your personality or your understanding of your own self is 
is taking a hit. It's growing. It's forming. Um, there are ups and downs always. So, and, and given the taboo of mental health assistance, even today, um, how does how does change come into the system? Can we expect any change at all uh, to come in, or are we just going to keep trying? Let me, let me try and break it up into two parts. One is about the mental, uh, the, the 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 school and the uh, schools and colleges and the bullying part of it. Mm -hmm. The second okay. is about acknowledging mental, uh, the need for mental he health help. Let's put it that way. Okay. You know, because that could be for a variety of reasons, not just linked to bullying and uh, ragging and all of that. Right. It's a that's a whole lot of subject. Bullying is bullying and ragging probably are from by people who are victims of that and one at one level. But I would think they're a very small minority of that. Very, very small minority. Mm. Now, when you talk of bullying and thing, I you know I've I've headed a school and a college and I've been a part of that school. So I've been a student in that school. So I have been both at the receiving end and at the observing end, if you want to call it so. Um, mm -hmm. And as a senior, I might have been at the giving end also. So I've gone through. <laughs> All the stages at one level. I think you see. I have. I, I was talking about this yesterday with somebody. You, you know, it's very difficult. There are two parts to it. One is some people do this. Just I think it's part of growing up. Children do it. It's a luckily it's not a majority. Let's be clear about it. I'm mm -hmm. I'm fairly convinced about that. Some people are just naturally vindictive and and uh, you know uh, abusive. Let's put it that way. I think a lot of them. You can't do much in a school because it comes from somewhere else. It comes from their upbringing, their family, their social context, circumstances, and so on and so forth. And to expect the school to do anything about it is extremely, ex or the school or the college to do anything about it, is very, very difficult because it, it, it's, you know, you're dealing with a thousand kids or two thousand kids, and there are five or six or seven or ten of them who do it. I don't think the percentages are much more than that, to be honest with you. I don't think so. Even in my time, with my classmates, we would know three or four guys who would have been bullies when we were young and I was in the, the same residential school. So I'm saying, I knew, we knew that these were the four or five people, seniors who were terrible. We knew that these 15 people were outstandingly nice people, were the same role that they could have played. So I think colleges and schools have a challenge in that they can only do so much and not more than that because that's all they have access to. Having said that, it's again about being, it's, it's about a way of doing it. Now, when I went to Lawrence School, because of my counseling background, because of my alumni connection, because of my school connection, and the little bit of wisdom I had gathered over the years, I learned one thing and no, knowledge of a boarding school. I told my teachers very clearly that if you see errant, devious beha deviant behavior, do not punish the kid. I would like to first talk to the student. So the right. only one thing I have learned over 30 years of counseling is every everybody behaves in a way for which there is some cause. Yes. We may not know the cause. We may not be able to identify the cause. We may not have control over the cause. But we do know that nobody behaves randomly. Right. It could be childhood. It could be this. It could be that. It could be abusive parents. It could be whatever it may be. So I was lucky I was able to do that to some extent. Hmm. But having said that, in large colleges and institutions, you know, it's very, very difficult to 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 handle it. I I I I can only say that I I I sympathize, not just empathize, but sympathize with administrators of large organizations uh, which have to do this because you know the raw material is being sent to you. Mm. You know, when I was the principal of Lawrence, many parents would try this line on me and I would say, don't even try this line on me. <laughs> and they would say, you know, you, we leave your child, our child with you. You are the parents for this. You have, I said, no, no, cut out all this. Right. I said, you are giving the child who is already formed. My job is to mold this into something better, but do not, I cannot be a father and mother for your child. Mm. There's no way I can do that. So don't try this because don't try to throw the monkey onto my back. No, I will not do that. I will not take that. But this is what people tend to do. So my thing is, my thing is, if if school administration needs to look at really the extremities that you know the extreme uh, cases of of bullying, ragging, mm -hmm. bullying. Typically, I would again differentiate between ragging and bullying. In bullying, I would differentiate between abuse.
and normative, let's put it that way. You know, I, every house has its bully. I mean, the, the, junior, the youngest in the house is always bullied by the seniors. Let's face it, you know, it's, it's a mild form of bullying. So the youngest who has to get up and get the water. It's the youngest who has to do this. It's the youngest who has to do that. In, in, in homes, we accept that saying age, age. This gets extended in some form or other, in some form. Unfortunately, it takes an extreme, unfortunately. So this is why I said when I was the principal, I said I want to distinguish between genuine growing up mischief and abusive behavior. I said I'm very clear that they're two different things. Mm. I'm good with growing up with mischief. I want you guys to be naughty. I don't want a bunch of nerds in my school. On the mental health part, you, you know, uh, I think things have changed. The tragedy is all over the world and India, we are, I can see the difference in the last 30 years. Mental health always has a stigma that the minute you say mental health, it's all about madness. It's yeah. about madness. Yeah. You know, that's it. And the, the, the reality is you need two, com two things to make you healthy. You need physical health and you need mental health. A healthy body and a healthy mind is something that you need. And the unfortunate reality is the physical affects the mental, the mental affects the physical, you know, psychosomatic True. problems and so on and so forth. Yeah. Now, this yeah. acknowledgement, in my view, is coming gradually in the last 30 years, fair amount of change. Because when you talk of mental health, again, there is a whole lot of, you're, not, you're talking about a lot of things that can be there. There is major mental illness, there's minor mental illness. See, all of us goes through our ups and downs. Mm -hmm. We all go through our it's nobody's perfect. We, we, you know, I feel low, I feel this, I feel nervous before an exam, I'm anxious before the grades come, I'm uh, I'm angry with somebody. But then you know, we all have our ups, we come back to normal. We have our ups, come back to normal. This is what we call transient situational stress factors. It's transient, it's situational. The simplest example I can give, which all of us can relate to, is when somebody very close to us passes away. You know, your monk, your thinking gets clouded, your ability to think rationally gets gets impeded and so on. Now, that's a stress factor, but that's not, you're not mentally ill, but you're still mentally at that point of time dysfunctional Correct. in some form or the other. Yeah. So we need to differentiate between the two. So today, I think people are slowly realizing that a large amount, many of us, there are, are going through what you might call transient situational disorders. And those things are take care, get taken care of by people like us in counseling. Okay. And then you have the major mental illnesses, which are really from the body. It's, it's chemical, it's chemical uh, you know, uh, actions that are taking place. Mm -hmm. There you need medication. No amount of counseling is going to help you. Okay. So I think when we talk of mental health, we need to understand the categories of mental health, the dimensions of mental health. And so on. So today the stigma is going. Why do I say that? You know, we have in 30 odd years, we must have seen about 17, 18,000 people in, in Vishwas mm -hmm. for a completely free mm -hmm. service organization. We have never charged a rupee in, in 31 years. We are all volunteers. We have never been paid a rupee in 31 years. Wow. But 18,000 people come. Today, 90% of the people who walk into our doors come in because of a reference of somebody who has come to us. That okay. is a clear indication to say the stigma is moving. At least to those who have come to it see the benefit of it. And they're able to. Maybe we still have a long way to go. Yeah, but sure. slowly and steadily, it is sort of breaking I down uh, the walls of it. That's yes. wonderful. Before we go, uh, this has been a wonderful talk. And I definitely want to have maybe a, a second session of this. But before we go today... I'd like to read an, an excerpt from your first chapter in the book. It says here, in their continuous anxiety to get the best opportunities for their children, at various stages of their growing up, parents experience high levels of anxiety. And this anxiety naturally gets transferred to their children who are also on journeys, really. not necessarily of their own making, but those decided by the parents. So I read this and... The rest of the paragraph, once, I read this for the second time and then for the third time. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, younger couples choose not to have children or, or are open to um, surrogacy and adoption. So do you think that maybe this, these traits of parenthood could uh, be positively influenced by these changes? 
I don't, I, 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 I'm again, you know, my, my disclaimer is I'm not a social scientist. I personally don't think so. I personally don't think so. I think, I think it's just that the way things have changed again, if you look at it, uh, uh, I, I, I can see this relating to, you know, my, my, my peers, my life, my own personal life and so on. What's happening today is one is a sense of independence, a sense mm. of not wanting to be crowded by responsibilities. Right. So there are many, many people who say, I, we don't want children. We don't. In fact, what surprises me, Pallavi, is why people get married in this current generation, to be honest with you. <laughs> I've asked a lot of people that. They don't have an answer. I've asked a lot of youngsters that. And funnily, they don't have an answer. They just smile it off. Because it's, it's like this. See, these are the things that have fascinated me. Uh, so when you talk about uh, children and family and all, the, the worldview is changing. I find that there are lots of my children's friends who want two, three children. There are lots of them who don't want children at all. So I don't know if there is a trend in any one which way, to be honest with you. I don't think there's a trend. Personally speaking, I have seen enough of my sons and daughters' friends who, who, who are actually happy with two or three kids. There is somebody who says one and no more. Mm-hmm. And there are people who say never a kid. I don't know if it's, 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 and I think they all come from good, stable families. It's not that they come from it. I think it's the worldview of what are they looking for in life. They're looking for in life. And, and in some ways, I think the, 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 the 20, 30 year old of today is very different from a, a 30 year old of 30 years ago. Right. Let's look at it in a very simple manner. I keep telling my, in my family, I keep telling my family, I said, you know, the way we molly coddle our children when they're 35 and 40, my grandmother was a grandmother at 40. Everybody's in that generation. In that People generation, are, yes. So I am saying today the world is at, I, I, I am saying at, at 29, 30, 31, 32, my grandmother was looking after a kid, two kids, three kids. <laughs> today, my, Children at 31, young people at 31 find it difficult to get up at 10 o'clock in the morning. They get up at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. So we are not living in the same world. We, at 32, a 32-year-old 32 today hasn't grown up from 16. And a 32 of 35 or 60 years ago, God, the kind of responsibility that he or she was taking on their shoulder was huge. Huge. You know? So yes. I think, so therefore, I was... We, we keep talking about this. Amount. The generation today has the luxury of doing things and not worrying about it. Yeah, we know. And so, choosing the amount of responsibility they would want exactly. to take in their lives. Exactly. Right. exactly. Right. And I think many, many of them, I don't know if this is true, but you know, this is an old man's hypothesis <laughs> that many of them today. So I asked this question when two people are living in for three, four, five years, I've asked a lot of my young friends on this question. And they suddenly decide to get married. I said, why would you want to do something like this? <laughs> right. It doesn't make sense to me. It actually doesn't make sense to me. I would only make one observation on what, what I, it, for me, it really doesn't matter whether one gets married or doesn't get married. You have a children or don't get children. Or not. My book is all about think about it and do something after thinking. That's all. It will not happen naturally because our stream just let us flow. <laughs> Today, it's a lot more of a thought process. We, we didn't have to work on relationships. Today, you have to work to keep a relationship going. Yeah, it's not going to happen naturally. Mm-hmm. So I am just saying, understand the dynamics of the world today. I'm not for a moment suggesting you should get married or you shouldn't get married. I used to tell my children that. I'm not even suggesting that. But I said, if you are going to get married, there is a suitable time to get married when your life for the next 30, 40 years can be comfortable. Absolutely. <laughs> That's all I'm saying, you know, but I'm not an advocate of marriage. I'm not an advocate of celibacy. So my five eyes in that book is really, it's really, a, so if I can close this, I, I will close it. I mean, if I can, you see, it's not a self-help group, but as I say, you can look at this elephant from so many different perspectives. Books have been written. Millions of books have been written. This is one more, but this is for me a very simple thing. As I said, it's a GPS a GPS. And again, if you read the book, you know that, you know, we are all actually, why are we doing the rat race? Because we want to be successful because we know success equal to happiness, but ha- success is not equal to happiness. Equal to happiness. Is we have yes. seen it. So the point I want to make is these are five ingredients, five. So, you know, when I came out of my B school, I had this fabulous boss who was a ruthless guy, but a lovable boss. <laughs> one day in one of my, I just come out of school, B school and 
thought I was the God's gift to mankind. <laughs> and he wanted a report written. And I said, sir, you know, it'll take me some time and this and that. He says, wait a minute. Okay. He says, don't give me all this. He's a BA from somewhere. <laughs> and then he tells me, he says, you know, you're like a chartwala. We are all like chartwalas. So uh, I said, what do you mean by chartwala? He says, let me explain. He says, when you go to a chartwala, when he gives you a menu, how many ingredients do you have? How many recipe, menu items do you have? I'll say it depends depending on whether you go to Aldiram or you go to somebody else, but you may get anywhere from 100 to 300 items. Right. He says, yes. And he says, tell me how many ingredients does he have to make the charts? I would say about 8, 10 major ingredients. He mm -hmm. says, exactly. He says, that's it. Life is about working with 8, 10 ingredients. And the chartwala skill comes in, is, is in only two things. One is he knows what ingredient can do what and what it cannot do. And the second is how much of each ingredient to use in different recipes. <laughs> so for me, the five eyes are, these are broad areas you can work on. You decide which one is more or less for you, which one you want to work on, which one you don't want to work on. But for me, I, uh, these five eyes, you can't go wrong. And, and therefore, my last favorite one is, it's like a chavan brush. Because a chavan prank, if you have, if you're lucky, it will do you good, but it will certainly not do you harm. That is the reason why I think today's generation needs to think through this a little more. Absolutely. Thank you so much for making time and doing this with me. And like I said, I definitely would like for more sessions with you, but we will plan on that and work around your schedule. My first conversation with Mr. Venkateshwaran was a casual one, but it brought clarity to my path with Kathas. And I will always be grateful for that time he gave me that day. There's a lot more where that came from. And if you would like to connect with his team at Vishwas, you can email me at kathas.podcast at gmail.com and we can take it from there. Our next episode is with a young, passionate and determined founder Meghna Murthy, who has impacted many young lives with her work at Smitham. Coming to Kathas, aside from connecting with change makers from across the globe, we have regular episodes and blogs that get published. The links are available below. If you have a story to share, do email me or you can go to our website kathas.com. And until next time, cheers to your happy place and spread the love. Mm -hmm.